welcome back to another episode of What Do I Know with me, Joanne Pei. And today I have a very special guest with me. But before I bring him on and tell you a little bit more about him, I have to let you know why I want to explore this topic. You see, we've been told that we live in this multicultural, multiracial society and that we got to live in harmony. But frankly, I don't know a lot about the other races and religions that are in Singapore. Just beyond the public holidays, I would say that my knowledge of why they celebrate these uh, festivals and what it means to them is probably quite superficial. And then, you know, sometimes we read about news, you know, and it's scary news or horrifying news and it kind of makes us form stereotypes or misconceptions about religions and other races, which I'm very, very sure isn't the full picture. So that's why today I have with me Chia Junhao Harold, also known as Muhammad Fidaus Chia, to share with me a little bit more. He was baptized as a child, but he converted slash reverted to Islam in 2014. And I have so many questions for him. So let's hear it from Fidaus. Hi. Hi. First of all, mm -hmm. I am very nervous about today's chat. Why? Because I think um, when we talk about religion mm -hmm. and uh, culture and all that, sometimes we may not be aware mm -hmm. that we may be using language that is inappropriate or that may be offensive or it's not the right way to put it. So in, in any case, if I do mm -hmm. kind of come off like being disrespectful or anything like that, please feel free to just point that out. But know that I don't mean any harm and I'm really here just because I'm curious and I want to learn more. Sure. Yeah. Uh, firstly, thank you for inviting me to the podcast. <laughs> um, of course, there's no... I, I might even say something wrong. Hopefully not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So don't worry. Just ask me anything. And um, so first of all, your name. Yes. Right? Okay, my so, name. Chia Jun Hao Herald. Yeah. And then you've got Muhammad Fadaw's Chia. Mm -hmm. uh, so from what I understand, of course, our names are given by our parents. Yes. And then now you have a Muslim name. And yes. how, how, how did that name come about? Okay, so firstly, it's not necessary to change your name. But for me, why I chose uh, certain names to add on to my current name, <clears throat> because I wanted to embody the values that carry with those names. Like mm. For example, um, Muhammad is because of our beloved prophet. And the next thing is Firdaus is the name of the highest heaven. So it kind of inspires me to work towards that goal. Mm. And that's why I wanted that name for myself. And I still keep my surname because uh, that's my roots. I'm mm. Chinese and that's why I have Chia. Mm. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I have so many questions and I don't <clears throat> even know where to start. So maybe you can start by just sharing with us what was it like growing up? Because in your videos, you mm. mentioned before that you were baptized and mm -hmm. your parents are still Catholic. So for me, my mom is not Catholic. Oh, okay. she, She's a, f a free thinker. But I'm primarily um, brought up in a Catholic environment, I would say. Um, I go to Sunday school. Uh, they call it catechism in, in the Catholic faith. Um, yes, so when I was born, I wasn't, of course, given the choice to be Catholic. I was just made a Catholic when I was a baby. Mm. By the age of 16 or 17, that's when you get to choose if you want to confirm if you want to be a Catholic. Oh, okay. Yeah, and I was so confident in, in what I believed I wanted to be a Catholic. And so I became a, I said, okay, I'm going to be a Catholic. In fact, I even gave myself a Catholic name. <laughs> <laughs> on top of what my dad gave me, he said, why don't you get yourself also another Catholic name if you want. Um, and that's Harold John Fernandez. <laughs> so anyway, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't have to add uh, that to the show. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I mean... So it's, it's a full three like names, like Harold, yeah. uh, John, Fernandez. I was quite a s strong follower at that time. Mm. I mean, I would go for praise and worship classes um, and... You know, I was also into the evangelical side of Christianity. Um, so we do Christmas caroling <laughs> from door to door. Um, it was really fun, I would say. Mm. It was it was an entertaining journey, I would say. Yeah. Um, but I didn't really ask myself a lot about, you know, what I learned. Is it truly what I believe? It was more like I was there for the the enjoyment of my friends and the company that I have. Mm. Um, and that the the belief that Jesus was God that was just like simple Christian life I would say mm. and then I went to Australia so I wanted to pursue my degree in uh, Melbourne in mm. Australia 
um, then I wanted to do something that I really like, like communications and media, you know. Um, so I started studied film and philosophy was one of the electives I chose oh. because I was really interested to understand more about what I can think outside the box mm. instead of just looking at life as it is. Um, that's when, you know, my teacher warned us that this course will challenge you to mm. a point that you question even your existence. So if you're not ready to be offended in class, then this is not class for you. Wow. So I was there and it was really, um, it was really sensitive topics that they brought up. And um, also breaking down what I believe in Christianity from, from that point. Like, why do we say that Jesus is God? Uh, why do I go to church and follow a doctrine that the church taught me mm. instead of just reading the Bible and following what the Bible says? Mm. So um, why do I need someone to tell me what to do in, in a religion? So And then and all that start to build more curiosity and then I decided to be a free soul that I, I left my religion in the sense that I say I want to be an atheist. I just want to move around without religion. Um, and just have fun in mm, life. Mm. So, partying became my life. <laughs> in Australia? In Australia. Wow. So, of course, it was fun. You know, I made a lot of friends mm. from around the world. I mean, Australians, Malaysians, Vietnamese and all. Mm. Um, but then, my grandma passed away. So, I was in, in Australia and during my lecture, I got a call from my parents. I stepped outside and I picked up the call and she said, you have to come home, grandma passed away. So you get the next flight home and, and go for a funeral. So I, I'm back in Singapore. And then the whole time I'm asking myself this question, who is in control of death? Because mm. I was living an atheistic life, a bit narcissistic I would say too, because I thought that everything in life revolves around what we perceive. So what our conscious being defines our own reality. But the thing is, there's one element or in life which I cannot eliminate. There is death. Mm. And death is something that is sad and you know we don't want to face it. Um, when that came to me and I said, who is in control of this death? Why am I not in control of this death? Mm. Then the answer came to me that could it be a God? Could it be a, a supreme being? Okay, mm. yeah, yeah, okay. So at that point in time, you mm. believed in a supreme God, but mm. you didn't subscribe to any specific religion. religion. I was, I mean, happy with the YOLO life. So I was still subscribing to it. being happy. You only live once, you know. Yeah. Try skydive. I mean, I didn't try that yet. <laughs> <laughs> but try everything in life. Um, went back to Singapore and I said, okay, now it's time for me to start my career. So I started banking. Um, but I'm a newbie in finance, you know. Yeah, you studied communications Completely and then different, you right? went into yeah. finance. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, but um, everything is a learning curve. So I started from the basics, went through all my finance papers with the help of my colleague who became my wife eventually. Oh. I started to feel something for her because of her kindness. She's helping me and all that. So I thought, you know, this is going somewhere. But uh, <laughs> I said to her up front, I think better let her know up front that I won't be with you because you're Muslim. <laughs> you you told her that? Yeah, I, because, you know, we have different lifestyles. I am the YOLO party guy. You are the serious person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so we can't... I don't see how we can have a life together, right? So we just remain as friends. Okay. And she said... Have you given Islam a chance? Like, let it speak to you. Do your own research. And say, I invite you to go to the convert center in Singapore and just find out. I said, okay. I never heard of this convert center before, but I'll give it a shot. And I'm going to use philosophy to question your teachers there. So I was like arrogant. Uh. Wow. <laughs> yeah, and if they cannot give me anything logical or make any sense to me, that's it. Um, I'm not going to take that faith. Mm. Yeah, so went for the introduction to Islam course. So I, I wrote down three big questions that I have. First question was, why do you only believe in one God, not two or three or four or five? Like, who decide one God? And the second one is, um, why is Jesus or other like Buddha or anyone not God? Why do you say Allah is God? Yeah. And the third one is, so what do Muslims believe? Yeah. So the first one asked him that question 
and he said, "Well, he gave me an analogy. If there's a god that made the human head and a god that made the hands and the legs, which god would say I'm the all-powerful god that made the human body? They want to overpower each other. Eventually, you still need one god to to be the firm one that create the human being, because they would always say that they are better than each other because they are all gods, right?" And that that's one uh, analogy he gave. Second one is, um, <clears throat> imagine okay, you have a, a computer, right? You have a mouse, a monitor, keyboard. Um, don't they all need a central power source to power them up? So he said, think about this in nature and in life. Uh, there is a central source of power, and that's what I actually believe as an agnostic already. Yeah, a supreme yeah. being. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. So that made a lot of sense to me. And the next one was. Um, okay, Jesus is divine. Like if you believe he's God, he's divine, so he cannot die. I mean, the dictionary says divinity is someone who can't die. But if he died on the cross, then he's not divine. I mean, then Christians will argue that he rose from the dead. Mm. But a true sacrifice is completely losing something and not getting it back. Mm-hmm. I Means if he sacrificed his life, you cannot get back his life. But if he comes back, then it's not a true sacrifice. Mm. And if that is the case, then he didn't die for his sins, mm. and he can't be God again. <laughs> oh my! <laughs> I'm, brought, I'm brought back to that. Oh no. Okay. Okay. Let's mm. move on to maybe your mm. love story, right? Ah, so, love story. Because okay. cause your because mm. it started with obviously your mm. then colleague, now wife, mm-hmm. and obviously she was the one who inspired you to start this journey. Yeah. And um. I mean, I'm sure it's not all like rosy and beautiful and, you know, you even your choice to be with her, you know, was it met with any sort of... Challenges? Yeah, yeah. from your family and like your parents yeah. at that point in time. So, um, I mean, after all these questions are answered, right? I, st- I still didn't become Muslim yet. Yeah, I mean, I I uh-huh. watched your video in, yeah. in, in, in at, at length and you actually mm. did explain like the yeah. whole test that you did with um, fasting yeah fasting mm-hmm. and the whole test with God yeah. uh, but I'm more curious and also actually the video I saw the video you did with your dad which was really moving because at the mm. end of it I cried uh, the part where you know you both said that you hope to see each other in heaven and, because you both believe that there is a God a God and um, and I thought it was incredibly brave of you to do that but then uh th- that video was taken after you know you you know you have come to terms with it and all that but I mean, I'm sure along the way you must have met with some challenges and and questions and and you know disagreements. Mm. I think with your family, so it's a huge, huge, huge change, change in life. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, of course. My dad and I, my mom also, um, they get confused at times. Mm. So I need to sort of like bring the knowledge to them. Um, you, do you mean now or you mean then? No, even then. During the time when we have like issues like, oh, why you cannot eat pork? And then, no, actually they didn't know I was going to be Muslim yet. At the Did time. they know you've met they, a Muslim girl? and They also don't up? know. Oh. Don't know. Okay. Yeah. So I, I thought it was like a personal choice, a personal journey. and uh, But, um, so after I, I, when I convert, right, I also told my parents to come down to what, to mean, to give me their blessings. Uh. Right. Uh, that was when they know that I want to be a Muslim. But of course, during even after you become a Muslim, there's challenges that that is along the way lah because they don't know much about Islam themselves. So basically, you're saying that you didn't you didn't even discuss with them lah, right? They, they, didn't, they didn't see it coming at all. Didn't see it coming. Yeah. <gasps> but I think at the point in time, my 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 mom ever said that they, she thought that it's just a fluke. He's going to just be a Muslim for a while. Oh. Initially, she thought that way, like just for a while, la. <laughs> Okay, then maybe, just let him lah. <coughs> let him lah. You know, after one year, maybe he's with this girl. Then you know, maybe they don't work out at first. Then maybe uh, this thing will go away. Already. Okay. But now eight years already. <laughs> I mean, what were their biggest concerns then? Mm-hmm. Oh, the biggest concern was how Islam was painted in the media, which is terrorism. Mm. At that point in time, so they were worried that I would be led astray by an extremist. And end up going to Syria mm. <laughs> or something like that. Mm. Um, or just completely cut myself off from my family, which is again forbidden in Islam. So what, what would you say to that? To, to people who think that that's mm-hmm. what Islam is? 
I will just say to them, look not at people to determine a religion. Mm-hmm. Because people, we have uh, bad ships in every what, race or religion or culture. We have good and bad people, right? Mm. Some practice Islam properly, some practice like just a bit here and there. Mm. Everybody have their own journey of learning Islam mm. and even any other religions. So you should not look at people to determine what is the right religion to follow. Mm. Neither should you just look at one teacher, but you should look at many teachers mm. to, before you decide. Mm. But I would encourage you to read the scriptures itself. It sounds like your family actually didn't have much objections to it. Oh, because I guess I talked my way through it well. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Communications <laughs> a major yeah. help, I guess. Yeah, I guess, yeah. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I, the one way, I mean, parents usually look at your actions more than your words. Right. So if you are kinder to them, you mean you just be a good son, a better son than you were before, or better daughter. Uh. They will naturally see the light. It's not wrong to say that I'm not a very good son myself, right? Because I do at times argue with my parents, mm. or I try to prove them right and shrug them away. You know, say no, I'm right. You know, I'm correct, correct. You know, mm. or and this happens even sometimes unknowingly when you focus too much time on other activities and you abandon your parents, mm. spend time with them, mm. and this will hurt them. Right. So, in Islam, I find that I need to now have more things to to look at uh, consciously, to to uh, sort of embed into my life. For example, I need to now put time for my family, put time for my wife, put time for my children, put time for my religion, put time for everything. And Islam creates that structure for you mm. to engage every element of life. And God instills this as a structure to connect with Him. Yeah. So in Islam. Um, just like praying five times a day is a structure. How important then do you think spirituality is for people? I think it's just as important as how you feed your body. Mm. You also have to feed your soul. Mm. So when we focus too much on just the physical uh, consumption of benefiting our health and everything, mm. our body, um, and neglecting the other aspect of life, we tend to forget that become less God conscious I would say we tend to forget that he exists we tend to forget that there's a creator sometimes mm. in, in, our, in our life mm. so we we look at you know life and say there's no God you know this thing is just a passing cloud and I'm going to die at the 8 years old or something but in reality if if you if you leave it as that then what's your purpose of life is it just to be here and then die at the age of 80 and who decides at what age you die um you know? So can I then have a purpose in life without believing in God? No. Because you were raised in an environment where you believe there's a God, right? Mm-hmm. Like there is a, whether it was, actually you talk about Christianity and Islam is quite similar in that sense, that you, you, you've grown up thinking that there's a God. And then there will be people who grew up without this God or people who grew up and felt that God has abandoned them for, you know, mm. whatever reason because of the circumstances that they are in and they just feel like their prayers were not answered and all that. So there are people who feel this way as well. Everyone worships something. When I say that, meaning even an atheist, when he spent too much time um, doing his work or chasing after money, money becomes his God. It, you, you know what I mean? Like we tend to focus too much energy on one thing it's a form of worship. Yes. And speaking of this chasing money, do, do you feel like it's a very Chinese thing? Like, you know, people always like to say like, you know, the Chinese are like yeah. that, then the Malays are like that, and then yeah. people always tend to also think, oh, Malays are very happy, very contented, you know, they have very big families, and then the Chinese will think, yeah, but you know, you have so many kids, you got to like, mm-hmm. you know, raise them, it's expensive, da, 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 this and that. So, d- do you s- feel like there's this difference? Like, that's a very Chinese thing or that's a very Malay thing and... And and relig- has mm. got, has religion got anything to do with that? You feel? I think, I think one thing to be safe is we all should try to avoid uh, clashing culture and religion together. Culture wise, a lot of things in life we think is religion, mm. but it's actually a culture. Oh mm. wow! It's not it's not part of the religion at all. Okay. So for example, when I when I say Islam, do you think of Malay or do you think of Arab? 
Huh. Wow. In no, Southeast I, you, you Asia, see, you end up thinking of Malay. You see, that's the thing. I, I, can, I can say it, right, that mm-hmm. I probably hadn't really, or maybe I'm still confused now, or I, I'm not using it correctly, mm-hmm. that we tend to sort of use Muslim and Malay interchangeably. And it's not accurate, yeah. isn't it? Because Malay is a race and Muslim is a religion. Yeah. And and I think for the longest time, sometimes we get very confused yeah. uh, with this uh, as well. Did, did you did you have a lot of Malay friends when you were young? I would say not many. Mm. Well, <laughs> I, I didn't have a lot of uh, Malay friends mm-hmm. uh, when I was growing up. Mm-hmm. And uh, I would say that my, my journey was also quite interesting in that I was... I went to a Methodist church preschool. Okay. So I had to sort of uh, do your prayers in the morning and say amen and all that. Of course, at that age, I don't really know what it means. And it was all like stories. To me, because Bible stories are like just stories, right? Like yeah. Noah's Ark. It's an interesting story to me. And that was sort of how I understood what it was. It, I didn't know it was a religion. My dad, he's a Taoist. And so for the longest time, like on my, like, you know, when you have to fill in your, um, I think birth cert or like your particulars and they always ask you what's your religion, I always put Taoist, but I also never really thought about actually what, what does it mean to be a Taoist? I don't really understand either. Mm -hmm. Uh, what my dad does, I follow, right? Like we pray to the Jade Emperor on the eighth day of Chinese, eighth, eighth or ninth day of Chinese New Year and, um, we burn jaw stick, uh, jaws papers and, and we do this jaw sticks thing. And and I never really understood the significance of it. Mm. So Bible stories, there's a lot of uh, like lessons that you can draw from Bible stories. Mm-hmm. And uh, when you use even certain terms like, you know, it's like, like David and Goliath, like people understand what that means. But I remembered I didn't understand what does that mean? Like when you say that, you know, what is it supposed to signify? So then I decided to sort of, read the bible as a like like a storybook and i remembered uh it incurred the wrath of my dad he was so furious because mm. uh he saw this uh it says Sheng Jing, which is bible in mandarin the book and he was so angry mm. and um and, and this was from my mom who told me that he wanted to like wake me up in the night and just like give mm-hmm. me a good lashing about it and I think his, because his sort of exposure to them is they come to the door and they start to tell you about the religion and he was very turned off by that. Uh, so, so for me, I think I, I, I grew up in this environment where it's interesting because I had this early exposure, right, as, mm-hmm. a, as a kid. And to me, it's just stories. And, you know, I'm just reading a story. And then, you know how when you're like a teenager and then you're parents are against it and the more they're against it the more you're like you want, want to try you want to go and like do it right <laughs> yeah. uh, but of course I was scared la, so I didn't and then I also came into sort of different uh uh well I meet different people mm-hmm. uh I had a pen pal then who was sharing with me the daily bread and I was very interested in the stories and I actually realized that I found a lot of peace you know when I read the stories uh, that that was in the daily bread uh, but I wouldn't consider myself like a Christian or anything because I wasn't going to church. I also didn't know what it really means, right, to 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 follow a religion. Mm. And then I uh, had a friend who was into Tibetan Buddhism and I was also exposed to that for a mm. little bit and I kind of felt that it was very... Um, it, it made me feel very at peace as well because it was very liberating and, and the way the Tibetan Buddhists treat death was something that I found very liberating and... Like there's no fear when it comes to death and and funerals and all that. It was a, it was almost like a giving back to giving back to earth and you know going back to mother nature and also I, I just felt it was it was you know it's a pretty nice way to look at death. Uh, and then I think along the way I, I would say that I never really have one specific religion that I am uh, attached to. But Islam has always come up as something that I'm curious about, mm-hmm. uh, which is why lah, which is why I decided to have this conversation with you and 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 the fact that you were a Chinese, and then you converted <laughs> to a Muslim. I, I'm just thinking that you know you probably have a lot of the misconceptions that or yeah, I have. that that we have or the the sort yeah. of arrogant things that we would say you know about the other uh, religion. Yeah. Can you share what some well, of those were? I used to think that uh, Islam, okay. This is another misconception, right? Islam, Muslim. 
which mm. we use it interchangeably. Yes. The follower of Islam is called Muslim. Mm. Right? But That's the, re- the correct way to say yeah, it. Right? The, the, okay. the religion is Islam. Mm. So we always say you convert to Muslim, but no, you actually convert to Islam. And because of that, you are now a Muslim. Okay, okay. Yeah, the follower of the, the Islamic religion. Okay. So when it comes to uh, misconception, I used to think that, you know, the Muslims believe in a moon god, for example. Because, you know, because you see a cross in front of church and you go to the mosque, you see the, the oh, crescent yes, and the yes. star is the moon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I used to have that misconception uh, until I entered the mosque and realized there's no image, nothing there. So who are they talking to? They're talking to the air. <laughs> there's nothing there. There's no statue, nothing. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, I used to think uh, that Islam is a very bad religion that teaches people to be terrorists. I mean, after 9-11 yeah. um, and secondary school, you know, that was Polly, when my friends started to share a lot of these, you know, terrorist, R-rated, beheading kind of videos last time, they used to mm-hmm. circulate. I don't know how they, they send it around. And then I said, wow, this religion... How can you teach people to kill other people? Mm. Um, this must be a demonic religion. That was mm. like what I thought. Mm. Until I went to find out more about it. Um, and that changed my mind. Mm. Um, because most of the time, you have people taking a certain verse from a certain part of the book and just making it their doctrine mm. or their way of life. Mm. And then I see... Uh, so that, that day, I think my daughter, she, I, I said, because oh, she has a form teacher who is uh, a Malay and I say, oh, you know, it's Hari Raya. And then, you know, you should wish her, like, Salama Hari Raya. And then she said, oh, the teacher said that you have to, like, kiss the hand or something like that. Like, oh, no. Well, That's a cultural thing. So, it, oh, what is this gesture? Oh, like, what okay. does it mean? So, in Southeast Asia, they do it as a form of respect. Is it only practiced in Southeast Asia? Mostly, yeah. Okay, so, so in, tell me, in Arab countries, they don't. Tell me about this thing, because uh, yeah. speaking of Southeast Asia, it's very interesting because I, yeah. I took my family to Turkey before, which is a uh, Muslim country. It's, yeah, it's right for me to say that, right? Yeah. Muslim country. And um, and then my dad said something about how, hey, how come they are Muslims, but then they, the stray dogs are running around, they are petting the dogs. And then mm. in Singapore, it's like, oh, uh, the Malays cannot touch dogs and uh, dogs are dirty or something like that. So why is there a difference? So there's many school of thoughts in Islam. Okay. And mostly in Southeast Asia, you have the Shafi school of thoughts. Okay. And based on that teaching by Shafi, we do not touch dogs. Okay. Uh, as in, if you do touch dogs, you have to wash your hands in a specific ritualistic way. Okay. Yeah. But the other school of thoughts, they may not subscribe to that. So in Arab <laughs> that you were saying, it could be a different school yeah. of thought as well. Yeah. So I'm very curious yeah. because how is it like in your home then with you and your wife and your mm-hmm. child? and Because I see like, you know, first of all, your <laughs> wedding, you've got your Chinese wedding, you've got Malay yeah. wedding and then you celebrate like Mid-Autumn Festival and then you celebrate Hari What is it like in your oh. home and like how how are you going to raise your mm-hmm. son? Is he like a Muslim or like a... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I mean, both me and my wife are Muslim. So when we have a ch- child, it will be a Muslim boy. Yeah, okay. Because born right, Muslim. Um... What, what, what is the difference is now I have more festivals to celebrate. <laughs> really, more. I celebrate Chinese New Year. I'm kind of envious though. I, I feel just, like... I, just, I give Ang Pao twice. <laughs> <laughs> I give Ang Pao during Chinese New Year and I give Ang Pao during Hari Raya. Two different, Two different people. people <laughs> la. Yeah. Um, you see, as long as a cultural thing that doesn't conflict with your primary beliefs, you can practice. Mm. For example, Chinese New Year is just Chinese New Year, there's no God worshipping. Mm. You don't worship a God during Chinese New Year, right? Mm. It's just between cultures, we bond together as Chinese. So then you can practice that. So let's talk a little bit about your family okay. now. Um, with your son now, mm. he's a Chinese mixed Malay Muslim. <laughs> I mean, what's going to happen if one day he grows up and he says, you know, I'm not going to be a mm-hmm. Muslim anymore. You know, I, I believe in this other faith. or mm-hmm. you know, Like so, kind of what you did to your parents. Yeah. So how I are you going to um, respond to that? So I believe in life, uh, we have to walk our own journey. Right. Every parent is a gui- guardian, a, a, a person who offers guides to your children. Mm. At a certain point in life, you have no control mm. of, of whatever he chooses or she chooses in life. Mm. So answering to your question, I would say that I would do my best to tell him what I believe in. But at the end of the day, if he choose to walk a different path, right, I cannot stop him. 
I only can pray. Mm. So, so you see on the okay again in Islam when you die, we believe that each of us will be questioned individually based on the choices we make in life. Mm. So, um, if I've done my part, right, the rest is up to him. So you would kind of accept it? Would you say that? I would accept it. I would still love him as a father to a son. Mm. Yeah, of course, I would have some form of disappointment, mm. um, but it doesn't tear us apart. It should not use be a reason to tear our family apart. Mm. How I mean, how did the rest of your family members and friends mm. uh, respond to your decision? So most of the time, it's a very surface kind of understanding of Islam, mm. because I cannot blame them. I mean, they have no exposure, or maybe they do not really thought they should know more about it. I have to admit that I'm probably one of those. <laughs> <laughs> so because I, I don't know, and I don't have yeah. friends, and I, I really don't have friends who are able to share this with me as well. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So I guess maybe because we are not okay, in Islam, we don't believe in. There's no compulsion in religion. It's mentioned in the Quran where we cannot force our religion on others. We are not the controllers of conversion, but God. Mm. Meaning, only God can grant guidance mm. to whoever He wants. Mm. Um, as Muslims, our job is just to share the message, the beauty of Islam, and the rest is up to the person and God. I suppose uh, there may be people out there who are listening who are going through this, right? Um, mm-hmm. Either they have a child who is walking a different path or not I mean we, we don't even have to talk about religion just doing something with their lives that different that, that is different or that as a parent I don't agree with right yeah. and there will be children who are you know struggling to have this conversation with their parents about mm-hmm. you know their choices and knowing that their choice would be something that is going to be frowned upon or not going mm-hmm. to be encouraged by their parents and so they decide that they don't want to tell their parents about it even so I mean I, I suppose it's just giving these people some idea, like a takeaway, like what can they do, you know, mm-hmm. being in this situation? We have to keep working on it. That's what I say. Um, what I'm trying to bring across is marriage, even marriage, is not a bed of roses, Yeah. right? We have to always work towards um, understanding each other more, um, being patient, mm. being humble, um, knowing that life is a learning journey. Mm. And when you have that in you, you will see your spouse making a mistake or your child making a mistake as that moment and you are learning with them in mm. this journey. So I won't try to get angry with them if they choose a different path. Of course, I'm naturally, humanly, I'm disappointed because this is life. La. I, I you, sometimes think that it's an yeah. ego thing, you know. Like when we, when let's say our, cho- our children, they are choosing a path that we don't agree with. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so is it us just being too... Uh, self-righteous or self-centered mm-hmm. to think that we know better than them. Ah. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, mm-hmm. I, I feel like as much as sometimes it can be heartbreaking because it's so different from what we believe in. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, you know, is it the ego, you know, at work? How do we know we are open-minded enough? It can be a question on... Yeah, that. this is a question How do that... you know we are really open-minded, right, as people? Yeah, uh, yeah, like we because the, we human beings we say we are one thing, but then our actions sometimes do differently. Tell us something else, right? Mm. Like I, I can say that you know I'm very open minded and this, but then when I really, you know, have a, mm. you know, an experience that put that to the test, I might not be as open minded as I think I am. I know. So uh, it happens to everybody because it's something that is stepping out of your comfort zone, um, and also religion or you know way of lives speak to people in different ways. Some people receive it more in a spiritual way. They want to have like a sign before mm. them, before they believe. Mm. Some people use logic. Mm. Uh, some people use influences around them to mm. help them decide which path to walk. Um, and it's not wrong because God comes to you with a message in different ways. How do you know whether you're open-minded enough is when you can firstly um, listen to both sides of the story like in the news you get two sides you know then you decide we are all walking this journey of life it's always a learning journey so you you have to always tell yourself that I'm learning constantly and everyone is also learning Mm. Um, so we always take it as a pinch of salt don't get too overworked when people disagree with you I mean if you have a strong point then you must be ready to be put down when you're wrong Mm. so you must have that humility in you to say okay I'm wrong Mm. 
or I don't know. It's okay to say I don't know. Mm. Because we really don't know everything what, in life. Yes, that's why, what do I know? That's the <laughs> name of my podcast. <laughs> yes, I do think that there's a yeah. lot of things that I don't know. And if you talk about the media, in fact, mm. I've also just found out that there's so many things in the media that is also mm. um, sometimes driven by a certain agenda that we may not necessarily be made aware mm. of. And then, you know, the same kind of agenda is being fed to us all the time. So we may not necessarily be getting a full picture as we think we are, you know. And that's the reason why I started this podcast, because I want to intentionally seek out. And even then, I could be biased, you know. I could still be biased in my choice of, um, you know, the, my guests that I'm bringing on and, and the things that I'm, I'm, I'm learning and reading about before mm. I even speak to you. So that's uh, that's just, I, I also do believe in that it's always a learning journey and uh, whatever we learn today could be suddenly wrong tomorrow for all we know. Yeah. And that's why we, uh, it doesn't make us any less of, it's just that this intent to keep learning, I think is what will keep this world going in a positive way. Yeah. So this fun thing that uh, mm. I'm sure you get asked this before, la, which is, mm. uh, People say that a Malay man can marry five wives. Oh, is it a Muslim man? Yeah. Is it a Muslim man or Malay man? It's Muslim. Muslim. So a Muslim man can marry five wives. Mm-hmm. No, not five. Five? No, not five. Well, the condition is you can marry four wives. Oh, you can marry four wives. Yeah, but there's a condition to that. Oh, oh which nobody is? mentions. Oh, okay. So specific, okay, why I keep quoting the Quran because all Muslims believe the Quran is the word of God. Okay. It's unchanged. Okay. Um. So. We follow it to the letter. So specifically, the Quran says, marry one, two, three, or four. But if you cannot do justice to all, marry only one. Now, can we do justice to four women? The answer is usually not easy. Mm. Because, firstly, you got four mother-in-laws to take care. (laughs) Four four father-in-laws to answer to. Correct? Mm Mm-hmm. And then you have to consider oh, how do I distribute my wealth to four women of which if I give one a $5,000 diamond ring, should I give all four, right? Uh. And maybe this one got two children, then one got one children, then one got one children. Then how do I distribute the wife again to, so that's fair? And can you let your wife feel that you're not doing injustice to her, correct? If that is the case, can you be fair as a, as a man? Mm. If you can't, the Quran says marry only one. That was always excluded in the misconception. Ah, okay. So if, can you imagine if, really, if all the Muslim men marry four wives today, how much population would Singapore have? Uh, I don't know if this is a, a, a biased thing to say, but I, I feel like they, they have more children than the Chinese do. Oh, so for children-wise, we have a different understanding of why we have children. Ah, okay. Uh, for example, we believe children are blessing from God. Okay. So when you have children, uh, God will bless you with more. Mm. so we don't we're not afraid that oh just because I have children then I need to worry about this and that this and that sometimes um, of course that doesn't mean you have any birth planning lah. you still need to have plan for you know when to get married and have children and all that right um, but having said that we don't let it be a, something that cripple us from not having children mm. just because of money issues or something because actually most of the time we don't need so much to survive when you say this uh, we don't need so much to survive. Um, how do you reconcile this with uh, the possibility of a lack of motivation to achieve more? Aim for the stars. Okay, yes, you do aim for the stars. But if you don't get the stars, you'll be grateful for what you have. So the, the word is gratitude. In life, all of us are given a different set of challenges. Yes. We need to measure them and be balanced with it. Lah. Don't be so extreme, right? Know, know, know what you can give okay. at that point in time. Uh, this is again up to each parent to define mm. uh, what is truly necessity mm. for, for their own family. Lah. Is there anything that I haven't asked you that you uh, want to share? Maybe this one, yeah. which is most recent. Hari Raya. It basically means celebration of the fast. Okay, end of the fast. The fasting month is one month, so you celebrate the end of the fasting mm. month. But why we fast? It's because we believe that's the time when the Quran was revealed to the Prophet, peace be upon him. So, having said that, we are using this time to connect with God, to empty our, our hearts with you know, our sins and purify ourselves, 
to do all the good deeds we can do, but you should carry on even after Ramadan, of course. Mm. Um, and this is the holy month where we practice it with, mm. with fasting, mm. and and Hari Raya, which is this puasa, is actually um, the end of the fasting month. Oh, so it's not New Year. But why why do you have to look at the moon? Oh, because it, the prophets say after you fast for one month, the the moon will be a crescent moon at that point of the end of the fast. Oh. Just use it as a way to indicate that you stop fasting then. Ah, I see. Okay. Yeah. So how was it like this uh, Hari Raya after like two years of the pandemic and not being able to gather in big groups? Mm, it's a lot, lot better this time. I mean, during Ramadan, we will pray even after fasting for hours, um, standing in prayer with our brothers and sisters, you know. Um, and And when the pandemic happened, you know, we are a bit more disjointed. But mm-hmm. that doesn't mean we lost our connection with God. We end up doing more taraways, they call it, prayers at home. Mm. And it's another special sweet feeling of just being with your family at home, doing your taraway prayers. Um, but now when we come back again, you know, that, so- that sense of unity is back and you see your old friends at the mosque with you. And uh, that's a very sweet feeling to, to get again. Raya is the time where we would say sorry to our parents for all the past, you know, things that we do that's offensive to them, mm. even to my in-laws. So mm. one of the things we do is we we hold their hand and you know uh, say we are sorry for everything we've done. Some of the things we said that might be offensive to you that we don't know, please forgive us. And it's a way to bridge that, um, you know, animosity that you might have built up over the months. Mm. Yeah. You know, this is very moving for me because mm. I only read about it. Mm-hmm. I, I read about the significance of Hari Raya and it means, you know, also asking for forgiveness and all that. But to hear it from you that is actually mm. really practiced, it's not just like, you know, how like mm. you it's written that, oh, this is what we do. Um, I, I find it very meaningful. Okay. Do yeah. you have any um, hopes for what a multi, like a truly multicultural society mm. will look like. Yes, I hope that we can drop a lot of other labels in in how we label our friends, M- Malay Muslim, for example. I mean, we don't say Malay Christian, right? But there are Malay Christians, what? Mm. I mean, we don't say Chinese Christians also. We just call Christians, mm. right? Why don't we do the same for Islam? They're just Muslims, come from different race, me. Yeah, they mm. carry with them different cultures. Yeah, mm. I hope that the world, or at least Singapore, we can have this understanding that okay, drop the label so that we can better build that bridge to understand each other more, um, and and have more maybe even have, I don't know, like a uh, what you call it a summit. I don't know, like an open expo. Mm. Different religion, different faiths. They just share their book. People can just walk and mm. explore mm. whatever they want mm. and and then maybe help them to find spirituality in life and maybe have a certain grounding in, in that mm. yeah I mean we are already 50 over years old right, as a country mm. but for 50 years we have not really known what is Islam can you imagine? <laughs> yeah I, that's why I say that I feel I really don't know enough mm-hmm. and um, sometimes we are afraid and, and even I am coming into this interview scared because I I'm afraid to offend mm. or I, I might say something that's offensive or I might say something that's wrong or politically incorrect because I, I don't know any better. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm the first to admit that I'm, I'm ignorant. I don't know enough. My social circle is not big. And so that's why, you know, I, I wish I had a chance to learn more, you know, and, and just beyond just knowing, okay, it's a public holiday and, and all that. But what does it really mean? And, and I wish there was, like you said, you know, a summit, a, like a, I don't know, symposium or something, yeah. you know, to really allow us all to understand each other's cultures a little bit better. I just wish that we do have more of it. I don't know how. And that's why I'm asking you because I, I, I assume that you coming from this background of yours that you might have a little bit more ideas on how we could possibly do something like that. And, yeah. and, I, and as, I, as I've seen also on your social media that uh, you are doing quite a bit of such stuff. So maybe you can also let our listeners know like where can they find you and, and yeah. what do you do on social media? So on social media, um, I share the beauty of Islam. Uh, my YouTube channel is Shah Harold, which is the name of my wife, Shah, S-H-A. Ah. And Harold, my English name, H-E-R-E-L-D. So 
we put it together and I just got Shark Harrow. Initially, I did this channel mainly to do travel videos with my wife mm. and just upload memories on it. Um, and then I saw a couple of my, uh, Chinese guys who became Muslim share their story. I said, wow, that's so inspiring. I want to sh- share my story too. So I shared my story and then it, it went viral. And then I thought, wow, this one is actually a topic that people are interested in. Okay, so maybe I should get other reverts to share their story too. Mm. And I, th- I thought that is also a way of me connecting my children in the future. Because besides telling them what Islam is, maybe they might go online to find about Islam. And I have a library full of my research there for him <laughs> <laughs> to go and look, right? <laughs> to go and, you know, instead of if they, he cannot ask people, then the answers are all at the, the interviews that I do. Mm, people yeah. and that was how i stumbled on you oh yes <laughs> Yay! Yeah. and with that we've come to the end of this episode i hope yeah. you enjoy our conversation uh, is there something about islam that you were previously confused about that you would like to learn a bit more or perhaps there was a takeaway um, you previously had a bias and now you know you've got that clarified after our conversation Fadaos and I would love to hear from you, so please share that in the comments below. An audio version of this podcast is available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Do give us a thumbs up and hit subscribe so that you don't miss a single episode. And this is me, Joanne Pei and Fadaos. Mm-hmm. I'll see you in the next episode. Bye! <laughs>